thanks for coming. This is a great crowd. Um, I got to be honest, when I first got the invitation to come and, and speak to you about soccer and American soccer here, I wasn't uh, sure uh, if it was a legitimate thing. But, uh, <laughs> but I found out that it is. And I really want to thank uh, the Clinton School, uh, Nikolai de Pipa, uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's been really great already today, and, and look forward to speaking to you here. Um, it's a good time, actually, to talk about soccer. There's a lot going on in the news with American soccer. Uh, the World Cup uh, just ended in July. The U.S. got to the second round, won its group ahead of England, uh, and actually had kind of a missed opportunity in losing to Ghana because I think they could have gone even farther, potentially, to the Final Four, and, and who knows after that. Um, but also there's other things going on in American soccer right now. Uh, just yesterday I was in New York um, where uh, Bob Bradley, the U.S. men's national team coach, signed on for another four-year term uh, after uh, coaching the U.S. Uh, to the World Cup. Uh, and then next week uh, the inspection committee from FIFA will be touring five American cities um, to check out stadiums and potential preparations for the World Cup. The U.S. is bidding for the World Cup in 2018 or 2022. And uh, if you could believe it, I know that seems a long ways off, but the decision for who hosts those tournaments is going to take place on December 2nd of this year. Um, so there's a lot going on with that as well. Um, first off, though, I just wanted to say that I thought it was a, an omen, potentially a good one, that when I checked into my hotel here, the room number was 442, which, if you're a soccer fan, is the most common uh, tactical formation in the game. So there's no chance of me forgetting what my hotel room is tonight. Um, uh, a quick story. I went to my first U.S. national team game uh, as, uh, to attend the game uh, back in the summer of 1995. Um, it was actually July 20th, 1995, in Maldonado, Uruguay. And it was for the semifinal between the U.S. and Brazil of the Copa America, which was, uh, is the South American tournament that takes place every four years. And um, the U.S. lost that game one to nothing, but it remains the only U.S. game I've attended as a fan and not as a journalist, but it really sticks out to me still. Uh, it was really, really cold uh, that night. It was the South American winter, and I remember me and my buddies uh, really trying to stay warm that whole time. And um, I remember standing in the stands next to, next to some Brazilian soccer fans who were there to see their team. And it was a bunch of guys. I still have the picture. Uh, but they were dressed up as women. And really excited about their, their Brazilian team. And I never did find out from them why they were dressed up as women. But we had a really fun time that night, and it was a real cool shared experience with a bunch of soccer fans from a different part of the world uh, that I certainly hadn't met before and haven't seen since, but I've got the memory. And I found over the years, as I cover more and more soccer, that it's, uh, you can have a conversation in a taxi with a driver in any country in the world about the sport and instantly have common ground. You can do the same thing in a bar. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and you really do get a shared sense of humanity that I don't think is overstating things. Uh, during this recent World Cup, um, you know, just the amount of feedback from readers I got was uh, really amazing to me, but also from you know, how many different countries it was coming from. It was literally all over the world, and it was also in big numbers from the United States, which shows what's happening now uh, with the sport, or especially with the World Cup uh, in America. Um, I actually keep track of how many games I've attended live uh, of the U.S. national team, and it's called, uh, if you're a player, it's called a cap, an appearance of national team. So you have some players get 60 caps, experienced guys get 100 caps. I had that first cap in Uruguay in 1995. I have 65 now um, over the last... 15 years. I've uh, been to see the U.S. in Cuba, South Korea, South Africa, all over the place. I've got 40 U.S. women's caps in tournaments around the world. Um, 
And a lot of things have, have changed uh, over those last 15 years with the sport in America. Uh, I would say at this point, uh, the World Cup is a big time mainstream event in the United States. And I think that's very clear um, after this most recent World Cup. Uh, all you have to do is see some of the statistics. Uh, more people in the U.S. bought World Cup tickets for this World Cup than any country in the world except for the host country, South Africa. The most expensive rights fees for television for this World Cup in the world were in the United States. Uh, the U.S. TV audience, 19.4 million for the Ghana game in which the U.S. went out in the second round. That's higher than all but two games of the 2009 World Series and all but game seven of the most recent NBA Finals. And the audience for the final was 24 million in America, the largest ever for a men's soccer game. So we're definitely moving in a direction where the World Cup is a really big deal in America. Uh, I'm sure you noticed ESPN really promoted the tournament, covered every game, did it the right way this time around. Um, in January, I became a full-time soccer writer for the first time at Sports Illustrated. And that's something that I didn't know if that would ever happen. Uh, I covered college basketball for 13 years, enjoyed it, loved it, and yet was always hoping that someday I might be able to cover soccer full time. And, and now SI thinks the demand is there for that. I'm just curious though, how many of you guys watch the World Cup? Okay, just about everybody. So that proves my point, I guess. Um, as far as the tournament itself, you know, it, from an American soccer perspective, how did it go? And I'll be the first person to tell you, I think it was sort of a mixed bag on the field for the U.S. The U.S. won its group ahead of England, which is a real achievement. Um, you know, it was the first time the U.S. had won a World Cup group in 80 years. Uh, it also, I think, when you look at the way the U.S. won its games, yes, it was bad to go down early in so many of these games, and yet the spirit of the American team and the ability to come back in so many of these games, I think won over a lot of fans in America who had never followed this team before because it reflected some very American values about not giving up, uh, about you may have more talent on the other side than we do, but we're a better team, and we think that will give us a chance to win. And I think that's something that uh, Americans really responded to. The opposite probably was a team like France, which had so much talent and just completely imploded this year to the point where my wife was actually flying to meet me at the World Cup and stopped in France at the airport. She was watching the game during a France game and the French fans were actually cheering the other team scoring against their team. <laughs> They'd gotten so sick of them. I would actually argue that this US team probably punches above its own weight globally. The game I play with my other soccer covering friends is if you compared, if you added up the total salaries of all of the players from each team at the World Cup, I could probably only come up with two teams that made less money than the U.S. team, Honduras and probably North Korea. <laughs> and other than that, I don't know if there was anybody, any other team. And yet this U.S. team got to the final 16, could very easily have gotten to the final eight. Uh, and so, I think that's an impressive accomplishment. Yes, it was a missed opportunity for the U.S. not to get beyond that second round game. But if you look at how things have, have gone for the U.S., it's a sign of progress in my mind that people here were really disappointed that the U.S. went out in the round of 16. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, too, as we move forward with U.S. soccer is uh, the search for a goal scorer. It's the most important thing in American, or in soccer. And the U.S. hasn't had a forward who has scored a goal at the World Cup since 2002. In fact, some friends and I have, have tried to propose a half-joking, a, a soccer reality show where it would be called the search for the great American striker <laughs> and see if we might actually be able to find someone like that. Um, 
As I mentioned, I was in New York yesterday. They announced Bob Bradley would be the U.S. coach for another four years. I um, wrote a column today saying that I thought he's done a good job over the last four years, and yet I still am not certain that any coach anywhere in world soccer should get two full terms. Uh, I don't view it like a U.S. president where if you're only a one-term president, that's some sort of stigma. That's not the way it is in soccer. And so now we'll have to wait and see if the U.S. has made the right decision by sticking with Bradley. Uh, because uh, there's a chance that uh, status quo may not be the way the U.S. wants to go, and the history suggests actually that second-term coaches in world soccer don't go as well. But we'll see how it works out. Uh, as far as this, what's going on next week and with this World Cup bid for 2022 and 2018, uh, it's going to be interesting because you've got inspectors from Europe and South America and Africa coming to go to Jerry World in Dallas next week. And I'm very curious to see how these non-Americans respond to this palace that has been built in Dallas. I, I, I think it could be actually a really good thing for the U.S. bid. I've talked to people who think uh, that stadium might actually be the site for a World Cup final. Um, and I, I think 2022 is more likely than 2018, but I think the U.S. has to be the favorite right now uh, to win that World Cup bid. And if that happens, it could be great for the sport in America because you would have a 12-year period of buildup, which is a very long time, but would also be something for American soccer to really point toward, not just to host it, but to really think about putting together a team that can win it. Uh, there was a lot of talk about this Project 2010 that the U.S. came out with in uh, 1998, and it came out with the idea of winning the World Cup by 2010. And obviously that didn't happen, and yet at the same time, if you look at it in those terms, winning a World Cup in our lifetime, those are big goals to have. And it did work in the sense that it got Nike to give millions and millions of dollars to American soccer and the U.S. Soccer Federation to try and uh, improve the development of players and make the sport bigger here. Uh, host countries in the World Cup tend to do pretty well, much better than those countries do on average. South Korea got to the semifinals in 2002, and it had never won a game in the World Cup before that. Um, and I think 2022, if the U.S. were to host it, seems like a tournament that maybe the U.S. has a shot at winning. And I shudder to think how the world might respond to the world's sport and the world's most important trophy in sports being won by the United States. Uh, one of the things that I think people like about, uh, you know, I sat next to the guy this place is, is named after, Bill Clinton in South Africa. He came uh, and went to two U.S. games there. He's the honorary chairman of the World Cup bid committee for 2018-2022 for the United States, and I was amazed at how much he actually knew about the game. Uh, he had read the book, How Soccer Explains the World. He was fascinated with how um, you know, it's something that unites peoples from all over the world. And I remember after the game he attended, in which the U.S. beat Algeria, he talked about how excited he was to have conversations with the Algerian fans and to talk about the game and to be on the same level. I think he kind of enjoyed the fact that the U.S. was just, just another team at the World Cup. And so I do wonder what will happen if the U.S. ever wins a World Cup, if the reaction internationally will be one of celebration or potentially, you know, is the U.S. going to beat us in this as well? But it should be interesting to follow. And I, I do think it's something where the U.S., I think, can win a World Cup in our lifetime. And it would be a pretty special thing uh, just for Americans to follow. Um, other things going on in soccer in America, obviously these big soccer events like the World Cup have proven that they can get a lot of attention here now, and that's a huge gain. But 
the day-to-day -day part of soccer still has a long ways to go. Uh, there are leagues here for men and for women. Major League Soccer has been around since 1996 for the men. Uh, the women have their own league, uh, the WPS, which started a couple years ago. It's the second league for women um, in America. First one failed in 2003. It's hard to make sports leagues work and make soccer profitable in, in America on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but if you look at MLS, by next year, 12 of the league's 16 teams will be playing in soccer-specific stadiums, uh, stadiums that have been built for the sport around this country. There's an infrastructure there now that I think wasn't there in the late 1970s when the NASL was in existence and guys like Pe Pele came. There's also American stars that the league is producing, which didn't happen in the NASL. At the same time, MLS is still a minor league compared to a lot of the European leagues, and it's got a long ways to go, and yet each year it seems like things take a, a, a step closer to potentially closing that gap, whether it's David Beckham coming to the league in 2007 or Thierry Henry this year. These are some of the world's biggest names in the sport or whether it's Landon Donovan playing in America, the best American player. Uh, I think he really took a leap forward during the World Cup as far as his recognition around the country. Um, as far as the women's league is concerned, the good is that it's the best women's league in the world. Uh, the not so good is that it's struggling to survive. And it's a different landscape now in soccer here than it was maybe if we had talked in 1999. The Women's World Cup had gotten so much attention in the U.S. won and there were 90,000 people in the Rose Bowl, and a lot of people thought women's soccer was actually going to have a better chance of making it in America than men's soccer. And that's not so much the case now. Um, and so I hope that women's soccer uh, can continue to rebound a little bit. They got this league going, and the U.S. women's team is still the number one ranked team in the world. Uh, the Women's World Cup is next year in Germany. Uh, and you, you might be surprised to know that the U.S. women's team uh, hasn't won the World Cup since that time in 1999. So there will be uh, a fair amount of attention on that. Um, as far as concluding, though, when you look at the sport in America, uh, I've been covering it now for 14 years. Uh, for whatever reason, I love this sport. There are a lot of reasons, actually. Uh, both on the field and, as I mentioned earlier, as far as social interaction with people uh, here and around the world. Uh, and people are always asking me, including my editors, you know, when is soccer going to make it in America? And I would actually argue that when you look at some of the things that are going on, at how big the World Cup is now, at all the little things that are happening around the country with the sport, that in many ways, it already has made it. And I think that's something to keep in mind moving forward here, and that it should be a fun thing to follow over the next 10, 20, 30 years. And it may not be something you can measure year by year, but if I were to come back here 10 years from now, uh, I think we'd have a lot to talk about, about what's happened with the sport and the changes that have taken place. That's it from my end, but if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer whatever you got. Thank you, Grant. If you uh, wait for me to call on you, we'll get a microphone to you. Any questions? Well, I'll start. Um, Charlie Dan Davies. Mm -hmm. What difference does he make if, he's, if he is not in the car accident? Quick background, uh, young player Charlie Davies uh, is a good promising forward for the U.S. national team, played very well uh, at the Confederations Cup in 2009, uh, was in a very serious car accident um, in Washington, D.C. last October before uh, the last U.S. World Cup qualifier. One woman in the car was killed and he suffered some very serious injuries. Uh, broken leg in many places, uh, broken arm, um, 
he had a ruptured bladder, facial fractures. Um, he survived, and yet uh, his World Cup dream ended at that point, at least for this World Cup. And uh, by far the most important thing is his health. He's going to be able to live um, a normal life. As far as soccer is concerned, it's still up in the air whether he'll ever be able to have a soccer career like the one he had before, which is scary for a kid who's 23 and, and has that much talent. Um, if the U.S. had had him during the World Cup tournament, I think it would have been a real beneficial thing for the team to have that much speed up front. Um, a guy who knows the game well, works well with Altador, the other U.S. forward. Um, and might have been able to provide some more goal scoring chances for a team that didn't get many goals from uh, the forwards. I do. Yeah. It's coming around. Grant, I was just hoping you could share a story that I read about uh, this past year where you were robbed at gunpoint while covering the U.S. men's national team. So. I can laugh about it now. <laughs> My wife has told me I can't be a cowboy anymore. Um, I'm always interested in not just what's going on in the field. I'm, I'm interested in for my stories about what goes on off the field uh, and how that, in, you know, how, what kind of role soccer plays in that. And the U.S. happened to play Honduras last, I guess it was last October, in a World Cup qualifier in Honduras. And this was a country that had gone through a coup. Um, not long before that, about it was maybe two or three months before that, and then only about a week or two before the game, the ousted president snuck back into the country and provoked this standoff in the capital. Um, and obviously a lot going on with that politically in the country, and yet at the same time, the Honduran national soccer team was having the most success it had had for years and years and was on the verge of qualifying for the World Cup. So on the, on the one hand, you have the country being completely divided politically, and then you've got the country being united at the same time by the success of the soccer team. And I thought that would be an interesting thing to, to write about and to talk to people. So the day before the U.S. Honduras game, I ran a car and drove six hours from the city where the game was, San Pedro Sula, to Tegucigalpa, the capital. Stopped and talked to people along the way. I speak Spanish and um, got some good stuff to talk to ordinary people. Um, and it was, you know, the kind of stuff I'm looking for when I'm doing a story like that. In retrospect, probably not the smartest thing because I did it by myself. I didn't have a photographer there. And when I got to the capital, I actually went to the embassy, uh, the Brazilian embassy, where the ousted president was hiding and was surrounded by uh, police outside and start talking to some of the police about their excitement over the game and how they couldn't wait to get out of there and so I'm going back to my car which is parked five minutes away uh, broad daylight by the way it's like four in the afternoon and um, I turn the corner so the police who are there can't see me and this guy kid maybe 20 years old runs up behind me I'm like oh here we go and, you know, he had a gun and started screaming at me in Spanish, and, and I never had anything like that happen before. So uh, I didn't want to be a hero. I gave him my wallet and my phone and hoped that he would go, and he did. And I uh, got back to my car, and the weird thing was, because I'm, I'm a little shaken by this, obviously, uh, I had an interview with the president of the country, the, the coup leader, um, two hours later. And... Um, so I go from that situation to this other one, and his aide had told him about it, and he was like, um, you know, I'm, I'm sorry about that. I didn't, I'm sorry that happened. And, you know, it was a supporter of the other guy. <laughs> but one thing that was great about it was, even though I didn't have any money, didn't have my credit cards, uh, I had Marriott points, being a, a sports journalist, and was able to stay that night at the Marriott. In yeah. the back, Nathaniel. Nathaniel. Yeah. Yeah, Mike. Oh. Uh, my question is about the bids that we have for 2018 and 2022. Uh, you mentioned 
uh, that you think we have a better chance of getting the 2022 bid. I'd like for you to explain that a little bit. And then also talk a little bit about what barriers we might have to uh, getting the bid. You know, because like with the Olympics yeah. um, last year, there was talk of it was more than just, you know, technical aspects. You know, it's all about personal preferences of these committee members and such. Right. So, um, so the way the World Cup bid process works, uh, right now, obviously the World Cup that was just held was in South Africa. Uh, 2014 is in Brazil, and 2018 will almost certainly be in Europe. Europe is the home of the game uh, at this point, and I doubt highly that they would have um, three consecutive World Cups not take place in Europe. So the thinking is that a European country, probably England, will get the 2018 bid uh, to host it. And then uh, for 2022, uh, it would be then a country outside of Europe. And right now, the three most likely candidates are the US, uh, Australia, and uh, Qatar. Um, and I think the US is a slight favorite at this point. I mean, but, you know, the U.S. did host it in 94, so that may work against them a little bit. Those other two countries haven't hosted a World Cup. Um, and I think the vote, well, I know the vote will come down to the 24 members of this FIFA executive committee from all over the world. Um, and nobody quite knows exactly how those guys will vote and how they feel toward the U.S. or the U.S. bid. Um, a lot of people thought that after um, a president was elected in the U.S. who appeared to have maybe, you know, or appeared to be more popular internationally than his predecessor, that that might help with the U.S. Olympic bid for Chicago and then for a World Cup bid. And that didn't happen for the Olympic bid. Chicago got embarrassed. So there's no guarantee of anything. Uh, and yet, at the same time, I'm pretty optimistic that the U.S. is going to get 2022. I, they wouldn't have to spend any public money uh, or any FIFA money to build stadiums here as they have in South Africa and other countries, and will in Brazil. Um, logistically, they know that it will come off just fine here. They've seen that before, and they know the tickets will sell. One thing that the U.S. bid sells is the fact that the, the record for the number of tickets sold for a World Cup is actually still held by the U.S. in 1994. And they know there won't be any empty stadiums here. So uh, international soccer people want the sport to be bigger here. Uh, that's one of the reasons the U.S. got in 94. It's one of the biggest arguments for giving it to the U.S. for 2022. Yeah. One second. Thanks. Um, I, I think you could possibly argue that one of the reasons America has been successful is perhaps not European players coming to the United States, but actually American players going to the English Premier League and European grounds. Right. Is that the case? And following on from that, should the United States have hired a European soccer coach? rather than going domestic this time around? Uh, the more U.S. players who are good enough to go and play in the top European leagues, the better for the U.S. national team. Sometimes that's at cross purposes with growing the sport here for the league. Landon Donovan is the best American player. Would he be better if he played in the English Premier League full time? Probably. Um, so that's something to think about. Um, what was your second question? Oh, as far as, yeah, um, the U.S. men's national team hasn't had a, uh, a European coach since 1995. Um, and I would argue that it would be a good thing at some point to have, uh, just, to, just to change things up a little bit. I think, you know, Bruce Arena had the job from 1998 to 2006. Bob Bradley is signed on for 2006 to 2014. And they're different from each other, but they're still American coaches. And I, I think it would be good at some point here to, uh, to get a European perspective, not just from um, 
you know, tactics and things like that, but just to change things up a little bit. Uh, I thought Jurgen Klinsmann might have been a pretty good option, a guy who, uh, you know, lives in California, but, you know, coached Germany, he's German, uh, coached Germany to the World Cup semifinals in 2006, uh, but also knows the American sport and what makes it different over here. Um, but that's not the direction they're going in. Right, yeah. right here. Mr. Wall, what was your favorite game in the 2010 World Cup? First off, what was yours? Argentina and Germany game. Yeah? I'm trying to see which jersey you're wearing. Uh, really? You're wearing a Barcelona jersey? Lionel Messi fan? And Argentina lost that game 4-0. Um, my favorite game um, was actually, hmm, I would say, I thought the Uruguay-Ghana game was very memorable um, and had all of the ups and downs and changes in um, how you felt about it, even for a neutral fan, all game long. Uh, there were a lot of good goals, and then there was this very human moment at the end of it uh, when there was a penalty, and uh, the guy for Ghana, who had scored against the U.S., the winning goal, had the chance on the last play of the game to make a penalty kick and send his country to the semifinals of the World Cup. First time an African team ever would have gone to the semifinals of a World Cup. So he didn't have just Ghana behind him. He had a continent behind him. And I can't tell you on the ground there how real that was, that all the South African fans were behind Ghana. Everybody from the whole continent was rooting for Ghana. And a lot of pressure to put on a guy who's standing over a ball on a spot 12 yards from the goal where they make, you know, players make this 70, 80 percent of the time. And he missed it. And um, so the game went to penalty kicks, and, uh, and Uruguay won. Now, you'll also remember that was the game where what led to the penalty kick was a Ghana goal that was about to happen, and the Uruguayan player standing on his own goal line and hacking at the ball with his hand to prevent it from going in. And so that's another play in which Ghana could have won and gone to the semifinals. So it's a very human moment. And I would love for a story for my magazine to actually talk to the, the Ghanaian player about what, you know, how it's been for him since then to know if he's gotten, because here's a guy who was bawling like a, a baby on the field after the game. And you know, has he gotten letters from people? Has he gotten support from people back home? Or is he not? And um, so that to me was the most human game of the tournament. And it had the most going on, not just on the field, but, but kind of in the heads of the people watching. Bill in the back. Yeah. Well, good evening. Um, my question is, what is your perspective regarding the participation of MLS teams in Copa Libertadores? First of all, and second of all, uh, do you think the Superliga, the final will be played, I, I guess, today, uh, is positive for the Mexican and U.S. leagues? Uh, quick background for you. Um, Champions League in Europe is the biggest club tournament in the world every year. The biggest one in the Western Hemisphere is called the Copa Libertadores. Uh, it's all the top teams, clubs from South America. Uh, and Mexico, and unfortunately not the United States, and uh, U.S. teams have never participated in it, and there's uh, certainly a, a group of fans, uh, especially in the U.S., who would like to see a U.S. team be involved in it. Uh, what's interesting to me is that I actually went back in the archives at Sports Illustrated a few years ago, and there was like a story from 1979 about the New York Cosmos, and about how maybe they'll get to participate in the Copa Libertadores, and you know, here we are 31 years later and it hasn't happened yet. Um, and it would be great if it could. Uh, I don't know how much the South Americans want the U.S. participation in it. Maybe now that guys like Beckham and Donovan and Thierry Henry are involved, that might increase their interest uh, to bring the U.S. into it. They invited the Mexican teams into it because there's a ton of television money in Mexican soccer and they wanted that. So 
At this point, though, the U.S. is struggling, the MLS teams are struggling to even win their own regional tournament against second division teams from Puerto Rico. So it's kind of hard in some ways to argue that they should belong in this elite tournament. Um, the other question was about Superliga. Um, there's another tournament, there's all these tournaments in soccer. Um, another one between club teams between the U.S. and Mexico is the final is, is tonight. Uh, and uh, it's been around for a couple of years and unfortunately it hasn't really gained traction. Um, and part of that is because for soccer tournaments to matter, everyone has to say they matter. And if you don't have a way of, of you know, people agreeing on that, then it loses momentum. And unfortunately, I think that tournament kind of has uh, at this point. I do think it's great, though, for teams in, in, in MLS to compete against teams in better leagues like Mexico uh, to try and raise the level here. Okay. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Shamim. I am a Clinton School student here, mm -hmm. originally from Kenya, and I was in South Africa uh, in Johannesburg during the last week of the World Cup. Um, I did not get to attend any of the games, but I was in the fun park, and I just had a question. Um, there was a lot of doubt with whether Africa or South Africa had the capacity infrastructure to host it um, mm -hmm. and financial challenges and they were able to overcome that. But also with FIFA supporting the one goal, I think there was a nonprofit entity mm -hmm. just to promote um, the sport in underprivileged communities around the world. Um, what do you see in terms of what that meant for the continent in terms of economic development and also just promoting the public service side of it, like the nonprofit aspect and tying it with education yeah. and other programs? Um, as far as the tournament organization itself, um, everyone I talked to thought it was really well done, that it was the games were well organized, the transportation was good, it was, you know, any of the fears about crime and things like that in South Africa didn't really come off. Um, I had happened to live in South Africa for seven months um, through July of '09, and so I was there during the run-up, the lead into the tournament. And a lot of these concerns that came up around South Africa, that came up around the Athens Olympics beforehand, a lot of that stuff never ends up panning out. And I thought that was good. My experience was wonderful in South Africa, and I think a lot of people. Um, business people, fans, sponsors, media came from around the world and had a good experience in South Africa. And my guess is that will be a good thing for South African business and African business on the continent. That uh, to really get to know a place, you have to go there. And that if there were any fears before among some people about going to South Africa, that uh, those might have been addressed. Uh, this time around. As far as uh, programs like One Goal, I think it's great to tie big events like this that get so much attention to education initiatives, um, things that might leave more of a legacy uh, away from the soccer field. Um, I think now we just need to see what happens with that. Um, you know, I, I'm, I kind of have two minds about it, I guess. The, one of the main things about the One Goal Initiative was they got a lot of people supporting this to get people like at least talking about education and things like that, but all they really asked them to do was not to donate money, but just to sign a petition. And so it makes me wonder how big that might be in the end. And there were some other projects, nonprofits that did bigger things than that uh, as far as on the ground, volunteering. Um, I do know that there are a lot of good ideas or people who meant well that didn't always take into account the situation on the ground. I know one company donated a bunch of tickets to a township outside of Cape Town, but then didn't think about providing transportation on how to get those people to the stadium. And so there's a lot going on with that. Uh, but I think the World Cup in general, in the big picture, was a very good thing for Africa uh, and for South Africa. 
Um, and you know, I, I talked about it a little earlier here with some of the students. Anytime you have the World Cup in a country where there's a lot of poverty, uh, you know, you can question <laughs> whether it's a good thing to be spending millions of dollars on new stadiums. Um, I think that's a very legitimate question. I had been in Angola in January when they hosted the African Nations Cup, and they had these amazing new Chinese-built stadiums, and yet Angola is struggling for some basic services, and it has a lot of poverty. And I talked to a lot of the residents there who were like, why, why are we doing this? So I think reasonable people can disagree, too, about whether it's good to, uh, for countries with poverty to, to host these things. It's, it's certainly, it can make you wonder if that's a smart allocation of resources, but also there's some intangible things as far as we can do this and we can advertise our, our, our country and our continent in a good way. Uh, yeah, uh, Claudio Reyna is now in charge of the youth program in the mm -hmm. U.S. What kind of changes has he made to date, and then what kind of changes do you think he needs to make in order for us to develop local yeah. players to be able to? Well, uh, Claudio Reyna is one of the best U.S. players that's ever played the game. Uh, played, he was on the World Cup teams in 94, 98, 02, and 06. Uh, former captain of the U.S. team, had a really good career in Europe, and now that he's retired, he has been hired as the technical director for youth development uh, by the U.S. Soccer Federation. Um, as far as what he has done specifically to this point, he just took the job a couple of months ago, and he has, I think he's kind of figuring out specifics on what he's doing to pr uh, produce a curriculum that can be used for millions of young soccer players in America, and actually more importantly for coaches of those players, um, to teach the basics of the game the right way. And the U.S. Soccer Federation will then find the best way to distribute that, whether it's you know, through different local organizations or with, you know, through the internet, all that stuff. Um, and so what Raina has done is go around all these European leagues and teams to see how they do youth development. Um, because that's the only way the U.S. is ever going to win a World Cup is by producing young players in huge numbers at an early age and giving them the best chance to succeed. Um, at the same time, it's not just like a U.S. Soccer Federation project. I mean, in, in countries around the world, that's the job of individual professional clubs to do, and much more so than the Federation itself. And so, Anything that Claudio does, I think, is going to have to be connected to, a little bit at least, to what the MLS teams are doing as they start to now ramp up what they do with youth development. They're finally incentivizing the MLS, um, the local teams, to actually develop their homegrown talent so that, like the rest of the world, if that player then goes on to get sold to a top team in Europe, they can get a huge portion of the, the proceeds from that, so that, that incentive is there. Um, but this is something that's a numbers game. You need to get as many kids into that as possible. Uh, and then also you need to get them um, uh, more players, I guess here's the best way to put it is this, is that in youth tournaments globally, the U.S. does pretty well until about the age of 17. And then there's a, a gap between the years 17 and 21 where those U.S. players, by the time they're 21, aren't as good as 21-year-olds around the world. And so I think the U.S. really needs to get at that as well. And is now a little bit more, but it just takes time. One second. We got a lot of questions. We got a lot of questions. Kim, in the back. Get you afterwards. Do it afterwards. Hi. Thank you so much for being here. I am curious to get your take on one of the most divisive aspects of the last World Cup, and that is the Vuvuzela. <laughs> um, I don't know if you saw today that uh, they outlawed them in the European Champions League stadiums and for uh, the European Championship qualifiers between national teams. Um, I'm sure as if, you know, some of you guys may have been in South Africa, a lot of you may have watched on television. 
uh, these horns in South Africa were this kind of nonstop uh, annoyance. Um, and I think what happened is, I think a lot of the television networks around the world found some ways as the tournament went on to drown them out. Almost kind of like noise canceling headphones. Uh, I th I've heard that happen here in the US as well. But inside the stadiums, I can tell you, it was crazy. I mean, like, it, it's really annoying. Um, and if the players were being honest, they would say, yeah, I, I noticed. You know, players often don't want to say that they recognize anything that's going on outside the field because people say some awful things from the stands to players sometimes. But uh, it bothered the players. Uh, it became sort of um, uh, a cultural issue, though, uh, because it's part of South African soccer culture. If you go to a game in South Africa, that's what um, is going on there. Um, so that rightly became a, a legitimate question. Do you outlaw these things at a South African World Cup? And I think they probably made the right decision by not doing that. Um, at the same time, I, like, there are other elements of soccer, South African soccer culture that I liked a lot more than the Vuvuzelas. Um, and one of those was those helmets. I don't know if you saw them. I've got one at home where they have these hard hats that they call makarapas. It's uh, the miner's pigeon language there for helmet, where this, I, I, I tracked down the guy who actually invented them. First of all, to describe them, because you cut out sections of the hat, of the hard hat, and raise them up, and they're hand-painted with stuff for the various teams. And it's really a cool, artistic, unique thing. And the guy who invented them uh, was telling me how in the late 70s he was at a game, and some guy got hit in the head with a bottle that had been thrown. And so people started wearing these hard hats to the game. <laughs> and he's like, well, those are just kind of lame, you know, hard hats. There's nothing going on there. So I'll paint mine. And then I'll start cutting it up. And, and it's a really cool thing. And I'm hoping that catches on uh, abroad much more than the Vivazellas have. Right there. Right here, Bill. Right here, Bill. Um, I was wanting to get your opinion on the proposed changes to the CONCACAF qualification for the World Cup and if that would have any effect on how the United States approach to future qualification process. Um, so the story right now, and it's still developing actually, is that you have this long qualification process for the World Cup and you actually have to qualify no matter what country you are unless you're the host. Um, and so the U.S. every four years plays um, 18 games total um, to qualify, to finish in the top um, three or four of its region. And the new proposal that is coming out that may get ratified uh, is that there, instead of being one group of six teams playing each other home and away in the final round, it would be two groups of four. Um, and the unfortunate thing for me about that is that it would potentially prevent the U.S. and Mexico, the two biggest rivals in soccer in this part of the world, from playing each other in games that really matter uh, for World Cup qualifying. And I think it's become this amazing rivalry that has really done good things for the sport in both countries. Um, anyone who has an interest uh, in getting what soccer is really like should attend a U.S.-Mexico game that matters. Uh, whether it's in the U.S. or whether it's in Mexico City. Mexico City is insane. Um, mostly in a good way. Um, people there are very friendly, except in the stadium sometimes. Uh, after Mexico got the winning goal in the game there in, I guess it was 09, last August, I had a fan pour beer on my laptop. Uh, because uh, we literally, there's no press box. I mean, there's like fans all around us and I have guys giving me, what's the best way to put it, um, uh, obscene gestures literally like inches away from me. And I was kind of looking at them, <laughs> I'm like, you know, I mean, this guy's not going to do anything beyond that, but you got a real sense of what the U.S. means to a lot of Mexicans. And I actually did a story once on the, the rivalry for our magazine from the Mexican perspective of, of Mexican Americans in LA. And uh, it's a lot, it's really meaningful 
this U.S.-Mexico soccer rivalry to them. Um, and so I'd be really disappointed if there was anything that would prevent the U.S. and Mexico from playing those two really important games every four years. I'm going to find out more about what the real possibilities are, um, but that would be unfortunate. What's your favorite team in the top four? In the what? Top four. Top four of what? In the World Cup. Oh, in the World Cup. Um, it's weird. I mean, as you become a sports journalist, in America at least, you, you kind of stop becoming a fan, which is, I feel kind of like I, I, I've lost that part of what I got into sports for because in, in sports journalism, you're supposed to be impartial. Um, and yet, at the same time, uh, I am a fan of great stories. That's what I've become a fan of. And so for me, the best story of the final four teams um, in the World Cup was probably, probably Uruguay. I know they didn't get to the final, but here's a country, this tiny country in, in South America, that actually won the World Cup, the first World Cup in 1930, and won again in 1950. It's kind of like a team in the NCAA basketball tournament, like Butler getting to the final, but winning it. And so for Uruguay to get to the final four of the World Cup this year and do it with uh, the best player in the tournament, Forlan, um, for me was a really cool thing. And it showed that it's not just the big countries with uh, the most money and the most stars that can still do well. And I think it's a good story for everyone to see. We have time for one more. Okay, Heather. Hi, uh, Dan Sweeney. I teach here at UALR in the uh, Graduate Sport Management Program. I have a question for you about the uh, uh, revenue situation with Major League Soccer. In the 14 seasons now that they've played, they uh, have come a long way. Uh, they're primarily an attendance-driven league, but what really separates you know, the major sports here from the minor sports are television dollars mm. um, and ratings and so forth. Going forward, up until 2018, 2022, how do you see that picture changing uh, for Major League Soccer as they expand their footprint, both nationally and internationally, in Canada with their three teams? Well, it better change and get better. You know, I mean, I get how you go about doing that. I mean, like, you got to keep in mind where we are now with the ratings for the World Cup were good. You know, no matter how you looked at it, comparing it to other big events. Um, the ratings for MLS are microscopic. I mean, you could show right now Scrabble on ESPN and it will get better ratings than MLS by quite a bit. And so that puts things in perspective. Um, and yet ESPN, to its credit, has actually said, look, we're not going to worry you know, so much about ratings right now that we're going to drop our broadcast if you guys don't get better ratings this season. So their contract is through 2016. Um, and they're not paying a lot for it, but they're giving it the time investment to try and grow something. And I think that's a good thing for the sport. Um, but I think, you know, television ratings are hard. Even the NHL doesn't get very good television ratings. And that's looked at as more of an established league, and it is, than, than MLS. So if you look at the history of what has moved the needle for MLS ratings, Beckham is about the only one. And even then, only for a short time in 2007. Um, so I think that's a concern. Americans, understandably, want to see, feel like they're seeing the best players in the world when they watch a sport on TV. And now you have the added dimension that you can now get 60 to 70 live soccer games a week on your television here from all over the world, whether it's South America or Mexico or mostly Europe. And so people, even soccer fans, can see the difference between the levels of MLS and the English Premier League. And 
you know, MLS has this thing going where you can see games live, but they've got to find a way to close the gap. And this is what I'm curious to see if they're able to do that in the next 10 years. Can they close the gap with the top European leagues? MLS says they actually have aspirations to be one of the top leagues in the world. And that's not the same, I mean, that's not like that for like the Mexican league or the Argentine or Brazilian leagues. They're going to be feeder leagues forever, basically. So at what point does MLS go from being a feeder league to a destination league? And how are they going to do it? And, you know, those are answers that, you know, I think MLS is still trying to come up with. Well, you mentioned how Beckham moved the needle and same shameless self-promotion <laughs> for him. The Beckham experiment, which details that whole move um, in 2007 leading up to 2009. Um, he'll be over here signing, signing copies of that. Thank you, Grant. Thank you all for coming out. We'll see you next Thanks time. Thanks a lot, guys. I really appreciate you coming.